This video walks through a numerical example using bar elements in a simple system. Here's the bar element example that we're going to look at here. We've got a steel bar that has a distributed load applied to it, pulling on it axially. It is linearly increasing as shown, and I have a cross-sectional area. I want to break this into two finite elements and find reaction forces, nodal displacements, and axial stress distribution. The process I'm going to follow is first find the element stiffness matrices, then find equivalent nodal force vectors, assemble those stiffness matrices and force vectors into a global stiffness matrix and force vector, apply the boundary conditions, solve it, and do post-processing. So walk through the whole process with a very simple model here. Now note that a bar element, we, when we develop the bar element, we assumed a linear variation of displacement inside the bar. When I have a linearly increasing axial load, I will actually get a quadratic variation of displacement in my bar. So two elements are more accurate than one element in this problem, but it won't be completely accurate. If we wanted to do uh, a more accurate analysis, we might do three or four elements, but it would start to get cumbersome at that point. Let's walk through the solution process. First off, I'm gonna draw a quick sketch. I have two elements, three nodes, as shown here. For simplicity, I'm simply gonna put the middle node right in the middle of the bar, which gives me an element length for each one of 30 inches. Also, the cross-sectional areas are the same, and the uh, Young's modulus is the same in each one. So the stiffness matrices are also the same. K1 equals K2 equals AE over L times one, negative one, negative one, one. When I plug in the AE and L shown here, I get two megapounds per inch multiplied by that same matrix, one, negative one, negative one, one. Notice that pounds per inch is the right units for stiffness. Equivalent nodal force vectors. So these are the forces that result from the distributed load that's shown there, the T sub X. And to get to this, I have to do some integration with the shape functions for the problem. So the force is equal to the integral of the volume of the shape function matrix times the body force vector. I'm choosing body force vector for this case again. I could have chosen surface traction and I'd get the same result. So first off, the shape function matrix is one minus X over L and X over L. The body force vector is going to be the traction force shown. The traction is given in terms of pounds per inch. So I need to divide that by cross-sectional area in, term, in order to get it into pounds per um, volume of the bar. But then my volume integral dv is going to become a dx. So the cross-sectional area is going to cancel in this case. So I'm plugging in L equal to 30 and um, the tx term being 10x. I need to multiply things out and then solve the integral. But I end up with 1500 pounds acting at node 1 and 3000 pounds acting at node 2 for element 1. Moving on to element 2 then I'm going to integrate over volume two with the shape functions and the body force vector. So the terms look similar in this case. Everything's the same until I want to plug in lengths. So here it's critical to note that you're always going to integrate over the element coordinate system, which always starts at zero and goes to L for a bar element. So I'm integrating from zero to 30. However, my TX expression is based on a different definition of X. So I have to modify that. X is now X plus 30 in order for me to have the right value for that surface traction being applied here. So then I evaluate that integral and I get 6,000 at node two and 7,500 at node three. Note again here that 3,000 pounds coming from element one and 6,000 pounds coming from element two. That means node two will actually have a total of 9,000 pounds acting on it. Once we have the element stiffness matrices and the element distributed force vectors, we can go to the assembly stage. So we've got first off for element one and then secondly element two, um, a KD equals F expression. When I take the, when I assemble this together, I'm gonna to show you a slightly different method to what I did in the prior video. Uh, what you can do is expand out the matrix and the vector to include the additional terms that each one is missing. So for element one, 
I've got my one, negative one, negative one, one, but everything else I plug in with zero in order to make it a three by three matrix because element one knows nothing about node three and the last column and last row of this matrix deal with node three. Similarly, on the force vector, I've got my 1500 and my 3000 that correspond to the node one and node two, but element one knows nothing about node three, so I pick up a zero there. I then add in the expression for, the, or the, the matrices for element two. Here, the first row and column are zero because element two knows nothing about node one. And similarly, the first row of the force vector is zero. And of course, we don't want to forget to add in the reaction force, the point force vector that is acting at x equals zero or node one. Putting that all together, I get a single expression for global stiffness matrix and global force vector. Now that our problem setup is complete, we just need to apply the boundary condition and then solve. So the boundary condition in this case is that the displacement at node one is equal to zero. Our full system equation is shown here. So the solution process basically consists of ignoring the known degree of freedom equation, in this case equation one, and use the boundary condition value d1 equals zero in the remaining equations. So that's gonna allow us to simplify this expression. We're only gonna focus on the last two equations here and this negative one is multiplied by a zero, so it goes away. So we end up with this expression, which we can easily solve, and we get that displacement at node two is 0.00825 inches, and displacement at node three is 0.012 inches. Um, we're getting more displacement as we move further out. That's what we would expect. Next off, we want to do the reaction forces. So we go back to the original system of equations right here, and we take the first row, the one we ignored, and we can simply solve, write down that equation, and then solve it for the unknown, which is R1, and we get that R1 has to be 18,000 pounds. And you can confirm for yourself that this distributed load gives you that same total amount to the right-hand side, so my reaction force to the left has to equal that. Statics is satisfied. Once we've completed the solution, finding the nodal degrees of freedom, what's left is post-processing, finding those stresses and strains. We'll focus just on stresses in this example. First off, for element one, we've got the expression that the stress vector is equal to the constitutive law matrix times the strain vector. In this case, for a 1D problem, D, the matrix, is just E, the Young's modulus. But instead of just the strain, we're actually going to use the displacement or the nodal displacement vector pre-multiplied by the B matrix, where the B matrix is the one that's the partial derivative matrix operator acting on the shape function matrix. For the 1D problem that we're dealing with here, the bar element, the partial derivative matrix operator is simply D by DX, and the shape function matrix is one minus X over L and X over L. So my B matrix is minus one over L and one over L. Recall here that the D sub I that I'm looking at is the degree of freedom for element I, in this case, element one. We're gonna have a different degree of freedom vector for element two. Specifically, element two has degree of freedom two and degree of freedom three because it deals with node two and node three. So for element one, I've got D times B times the two degrees of freedom that relate to element one, D1 and D2. Plugging in the individual terms for this and multiplying them out, I find that the stress in element one is 8.25 kpsi. Stress in element two, very similar process, except here the degrees of freedom that I deal with are D2 and D3, because those are the nodes that connect to element two. When I multiply that out, I find that the stress in element two is 3.75 kpsi. And this also makes sense because element one is getting pulled by all the force to the right of it, whereas element two is just being pulled by the force acting on that element. The average stress at node two, remember FE codes use nodal averaging, so let's apply that process here. That's simply gonna be the average of the stress reported by element one at node two and the stress reported by element two at node two 
which comes to a total of 6 kpsi. But notice that the B matrix shown here and the sigma vector are independent of position. This occurred because our shape functions are linear shape functions. So when we took their derivative to get to the B matrix, we got a constant expression for B. That means that we have a constant strain and a constant stress inside each one of these bar elements. And it is a simplification of doing this analysis.